Breaking tonight, the FBI is investigating another assassination attempt targeting Donald Trump. A gunman with a high-powered rifle got very close to the former president. Probably between three and 500 yards, but with a rifle and a scope like that, that's not a long distance. How agents stopped the shooter and where the investigation goes now. Air Canada strikes a deal with pilots. So it's a big relief. Why a raise for pilots likely won't mean a rise in fares. K.D. Lang is inducted into Canada's Country Music Hall of Fame. Like, I really did grow up in the prairies. How she feels now about coming out 30 years ago. Kind of like sitting back and going, yeah, right on. Things are evolving. A conversation with K.D. Lang in The Breakdown. From CBC News, this is The National with Ian Hennemansi. A gunman is in custody tonight after what the FBI describes as an attempt on former President Donald Trump's life, the second in just over two months. Police are confirming the suspect was armed with an assault rifle and within striking distance of the former president. The gunman was set up at the edge of Trump's West Palm Beach golf course, hidden in the bushes, equipped with a scope. The former president just a few hundred meters away. A Secret Service agent saw the barrel of the suspect's weapon and opened fire. Katie Simpson now on how a would-be assassin got so close to Trump and how he was caught. Donald Trump whisked away by motorcade from what could have been a horrific moment in U.S. history. Escaping the line of fire of a would-be gunman, police say was laying in wait in the shrubs outside his golf course. Now, in the bushes where this guy was is an 8K-47 style rifle with a scope two backpacks which were hung on the fence that had uh, ceramic tile in them, and a GoPro, which he was going to take pictures of. Investigators sharing these photos showing the rifle with the scope, the backpacks, and that GoPro camera. Trump was golfing early Sunday afternoon when a member of his Secret Service detail noticed something suspicious. They have an agent that jumps one hole ahead of time to where the president was at. And he was able to spot this rifle barrel sticking out of the fence and immediately engage that individual, at which time the individual took off. At least four shots were fired by the Secret Service. Amid the commotion, a witness snapped a photo of the suspect fleeing in a getaway vehicle, including the license plate. The vehicle was stopped by highway patrol officers after the tags were fed into the state's license plate reading system. Police say he was arrested without incident. In a fundraising email, Trump said, I am safe and well. Nothing will slow me down. I will never surrender, calling for unity and peace. Still, it all appears to have been a very close call. Police say the suspect was not very far away from Trump. Probably between three and 500 yards. But with a rifle and a scope like that, that's not a long distance. Security around Trump has already been ramped up over the past two months in the wake of the first assassination attempt when a gunman fired shots at Trump during a rally in Butler, Pennsylvania, grazing his right ear. What happened? <laughs> While more resources are dedicated to keeping Trump safe, he's not getting the highest level of protection. He's not the sitting president. If he was, we would have had this entire golf course around it. Well, because he's not, the security is limited to the areas that the Secret Service deems possible. There are already multiple investigations examining the Secret Service and its ability to protect political leaders, which started after the first assassination attempt. What happened in Florida is only going to intensify those inquiries. And Katie, we're learning more about the suspect tonight. Yeah, he's been identified by multiple U.S. news outlets as 58-year-old Ryan Routh from Hawaii. He'd taken an intense interest in the war in Ukraine and had actually been interviewed by the New York Times a couple of years ago about visiting Ukraine, he says, and trying to generate support for the war effort. In terms of a motive in Florida, police have not released any specifics. Ian. Katie Simpson in Washington.
We'll have much more on the suspected assassination attempt tonight. In about 15 minutes, we'll speak to a retired FBI agent about what the urgency is in finding a motive and a sign the suspect may be willing to talk. Donald Trump's running mate, J.D. Vance, defended his repetition of false rumors that Haitian immigrants in Ohio are stealing and eating pets. If I have to create stories so that the American media actually pays attention to the suffering of the American people, then that's what I'm going to do. In Springfield, they're eating the dogs. The stories Vance is referring to gained attention after Tuesday's presidential debate. Eating the pets of the people that live there. Since then, Springfield City Hall, some hospitals, and schools have received bomb threats that included hateful language towards the city's Haitian community. It creates a lot of fear. Local officials say there is no proof backing up the pet-eating rumors and urged the Trump campaign to stop. It would be helpful if they understood the weight of their words and how they could harm a community like ours. I'm hearing terrible things about what's going on in Springfield. But Vance says Haitian immigrants have harmed Springfield. That's something Ohio's Republican governor strongly denies. I can say this, uh, we will do large deportations. Still, despite being there legally, if elected, Trump has vowed to deport them. Here in Canada, the fall parliamentary session is about to begin, and Conservative leader Pierre Polyev again called on other opposition parties to trigger an election. But as J.P. Tasker shows us, the NDP and Liberals are already about to face their own tests at the ballot box. Conservative leader Pierre Polyev is fired up. Your priority, sir, election? Priority, axe the tax. Axe the tax. Axe the tax. Rallying his caucus before Parliament's return. Sellout Jagmeet Singh wants you to believe he's a changed man. <laughs> and dialing up the pressure on the NDP to try to bring down the government this fall. Canadians cannot wait. They need to vote now for common sense conservatives and Jagmeet Singh needs to vote with us to trigger a carbon tax election now. His MPs are ready. Canadians are fed up with the government. It's time for a change. Well, I hope we get to an election soon. The Liberals are on shaky ground in this minority parliament. All bets are off. The NDP are going it alone and backing out of a deal to push through government legislation. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau may have to work with the Black Québécois to get something done. If and when the phone rings, we answer. But first, voters will have their say in two federal by-elections on Monday. In Winnipeg, a long-time NDP riding could slip away. The Conservatives have picked up support among working-class voters. This is the kind of riding that if the NDP loses it, there's a lot of ridings like this across the country where the NDP would be under threat. The Liberals, meanwhile, are trying to hold on to a Montreal seat. It's been theirs for most of the last century. Facing a tough three-way fight, the party is setting the bar low. By-elections are particular animals. They are not necessarily the occasion for voters to show up and endorse the government. Even if the Liberals lose this safe seat, Trudeau says he won't go. I'm not going anywhere. I've got a, I've got a fight to lead against, uh, against people who want to hurt this country. While Trudeau says he's staying, at least two Liberal MPs have said they're looking to leave federal politics. And if Singh comes up short in the Winnipeg by-election, there may be questions about his future too. J.P. Tasker, CBC News, Ottawa. As J.P. mentioned, that Montreal by-election is a tight race and a tough test for the Liberals. Sarah Levitt is in the riding tonight where some voters still haven't made up their minds. On the eve of a crucial by-election, some Montrealers are certain who they won't vote for. I voted Liberal in the past because I did like Trudeau at a point, but I don't know. I feel like he's not really doing as much as he said he would. A common sentiment in La Salle and Mar Verdun. The Liberals wouldn't normally be nervous about holding on to a seat here. The area has been mostly red for decades. But after losing a long time downtown Toronto riding in June... Well, I think it's <laughs> going to be close. The fact that this is in the Prime Minister's backyard and they're fighting for it, I think tells you everything you need to know about where Liberals' uh, support is across the country. Pollsters say this could be a three-way race between the Liberals, the NDP and the Bloc Québécois. Along the way, Liberal candidate Laura Palestini has had help from cabinet members like Mark Miller and François-Philippe Champagne. Craig Sobe aussi, yes. <laughs> NDP candidate Craig Sobe has welcomed party leader Jagmeet Singh several times. Bloc leader Yves-François Blanchet has also come out for candidate Louis-Philippe Sauvé. And the day before the vote, 
Green Party leader Elizabeth May offered her hand to candidate Jency Mercier. Do you have any idea who you're going to vote for? I'm vacillating over this. Kat Wolf has lived in the area for 30 years. I like the NDP. I'm not happy with the Liberals right now. I'm having a little bit of a conundrum of which way I'm going to go. Others, though, have made their decision. I voted Liberal since I was 18 years old, since I could vote, but this year I'm going to vote NDP. A feeling things could go in any direction has certainly upped the stakes in this by-election for all parties. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. Well, let's bring in our chief political correspondent, Rosemary Barton. And Rosie, what should we be watching for with those by-elections tomorrow night? Ian, you know, by-elections are first and foremost a test of the government. Certainly that's the case for the Liberals in Montreal, as Sarah told you. And while the party's been really lowering expectations, I would say using words like toss-up, a loss would certainly be more bad news and has the potential, I think, to get caucus really worried again. But Jagmeet Singh also has a bar to meet tomorrow, not only to hold that Winnipeg seat, for sure, but also to demonstrate that what he's been saying since he ended his deal with the Liberals, that the NDP is a viable alternative to form government, is actually true and possible. And Rosie, we're getting a hint of the dynamic that Canadians can expect in the House this sitting. Yeah, gone is any overt attempt at cooperation and collaboration, Ian. The tone and rhetoric is going to heat up further because now we're gearing up for maybe an election sooner than anticipated. You heard some of that again today from Pierre Poiliev in his speech to caucus, saying if the carbon tax continues to rise, it will lead to a, quote, nuclear winter for the Canadian economy in the future and, quote, mass hunger, a very dystopian view as an attempt to frame a future election around the carbon tax and affordability. But as the pressure grows for an election, so too will the pressure on Pierre Poiliev grow to not just criticize the government, but to start really explaining his own policies. Liberals and the opposition parties are going to keep pushing for those details and continue to suggest conservatives will only make cuts to things Canadians want and need. The lines of the next election campaign, Ian, are being drawn and it is likely going to get pretty ugly. Always nice to have you on the show, Rosemary. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Air Canada and its pilots have narrowly avoided a work stoppage, coming to terms on a deal just hours before flight cancellations were supposed to begin. Lisa Shing now on what it took to reach an agreement and what it means for passengers. It looks like any other travel day at airports across the country. A relief for passengers. Well, we're so worried about it, just in case the strike goes on. So we have to rebook our flight with uh, Swiss. I'm happy that the flights are happening because I have a flight back to Vancouver afterwards. May I have your Alpha number? At the last minute, Air Canada and the union representing 5,400 pilots announced a tentative agreement, averting a work stoppage at the country's biggest airline. It could have started Wednesday, but Air Canada warned it would begin cancelling flights Sunday. I have booked on Air Canada next weekend and the weekend after as well, so it's a big relief. In a statement, the union said progress was made on several key issues, including compensation, retirement and work rules. The company said it's happy the agreement recognizes the contribution of its pilots. The new deal, if ratified, means $1.9 billion for its members over the next four years. It replaces one made a decade ago that saw raises of just 2% a year, well behind current industry standards, according to this analyst. The Air Canada pilots were underpaid. It's a statement of fact. When you look at the numbers that the U.S. pilots were getting, their increases at Delta and so on, there was a very solid point made there, rightly so. For those wondering whether the pilots' wage increase will affect ticket prices. It is not going to happen. It's going to be whatever the market decides the price is going to be for the flight. Air Canada's 10,000 flight attendants also have a 10-year contract expiring early next year. And the union representing workers in airport operations and maintenance are up after that, leaving potential for more labor unrest in the industry. Lisa Shing, CBC News, Toronto. BC Premier David Eby is moving to expand involuntary care, mandatory treatment for those struggling with mental health and addiction. As Yvette Brand explains, this marks a pivot for Eby just one month before the provincial election. Just days after a deadly, unprovoked attack in downtown Vancouver, BC's Premier says it's time for change. We know uh, that the current uh, response that we offer is not adequate. Police say the accused had a long history of mental health issues, the latest in a series of violent crimes, often fueled by toxic drugs. It is costly for the people struggling 
with these conditions. They are not safe. And uh, increasingly, I'm concerned that the way uh, that they are interacting in our communities is making everybody less safe. Now, the province plans to expand its involuntary care program for those with addictions issues by opening highly secure facilities to house people detained under the Mental Health Act. The province plans to add more than 400 hospital beds exclusively dedicated to mental health, some new, others refurbished. I know uh, that this group of people uh, will be healthier, will be safer, will be better cared for uh, in, uh, in a supportive environment than they will be uh, wandering the streets of our communities and dying. In another shift to the NDP's approach to substance abuse, the province attempted to decriminalize some hard drugs, but scrapped it midway through the pilot project. It also comes a month before the provincial election, EB's main rival, the leader of the Conservative Party, calling for a similar policy last week. We need to bring an end to this um, epidemic or this, this terrible situation we have right now with addictions in BC. But critics warn there's not enough proof involuntary care works. I have seen no literature, no compelling literature, that involuntary care um, is effective for um, young people, for marginalized um, populations. Despite this, people like the parents of Brianna McDonald are demanding it. They lost their 13-year-old to drugs. She died after being discharged from medical care against their wishes. I can't even imagine uh, what her parents are going through. I think it's every parent's worst nightmare. E.B. says his changes will save people too unwell to save themselves. Uh, Yvette Bren, CBC News, Vancouver. At least eight people are dead and more are missing after torrential rain triggered extreme flooding in Central Europe. Storm Boris has forced mass evacuations and left tens of thousands of people without power. Entire neighborhoods are submerged in the Czech Republic, Poland and Romania. Parts of Austria, Hungary and Slovakia are also dealing with flooding. We want to return to our top story, an apparent second assassination attempt on Donald Trump. Yes, the, the threat level is high. I speak with a former FBI agent to find out where the investigation goes from here. More than a year after the Titan submersible imploded, an inquiry into what went wrong. This is one of the most complex investigations that I've ever been involved with. A BC man heads to university at 71 and ends up in class with his grandson. I'm an anchor in his social life. We're back in two. In the bushes where this guy was, is an 8K-47 style rifle with a scope. Returning to our top story, the FBI's investigation into a suspected attempt on Donald Trump's life, the second in two months. Police say the gunman hid in the bushes just outside Trump's West Palm Beach golf course, gun and scope in hand, and a camera set up to record everything. Investigators adding the shooter was within range of the former president before a Secret Service agent noticed the barrel of his gun and opened fire. Donald Trump was unharmed. Let's bring in Kenneth Gray, who was an FBI special agent for 24 years. And Kenneth, based on what we've been told publicly to this point about the incident, what's your reaction? So, Ian, this sounds like a very serious threat, a second, a second attempt on uh, President Trump's life. Uh, the shooter was within rifle distance at the time that he was discovered, but he was laying in wait, waiting for the president to get closer. So this really is a serious attempt on the uh, former president's life. You have worked in counterterrorism, among other investigations, in your time with the FBI. Um, it's been just a few hours since this attempt. What are FBI agents likely focusing on tonight? So there's two different aspects of this investigation. One is a criminal aspect, that is, being able to gather all the evidence, all the information, all the interviews in order to prosecute this person for this attempt. But uh, the second part, though, is to look into the immediacy of the threat. That is, uh, was this person acting alone? Was he acting uh, at the direction of others? Uh, was there any indications that he was planning to do this? These are all things that are necessary to find out to see if there's any additional threats anything that could be uh, used to stop the next type of event from happening. And so there are a lot of different, uh, different areas 
of the investigation. But the immediacy here is to see if this is the only threat or if there's any more and whether it has been totally wrapped up or if there were anybody working in concert with them. I, I can't imagine how much noise there is out there on social media and the internet, which could be a threat, might not be a threat. But after these two attempts in two months, how do you think the FBI is going about trying to assess future threats? So the tips line that the FBI uses is one source of information where people are sending uh, anonymously in some cases, but uh, uh, in other cases identifying themselves, but providing information. All those tips have to be run down. And so a lot of it, as you say, is noise. A lot of it may not lead anywhere. But uh, as we get closer to the election, after two attempts on former President Trump's life, you can imagine that the number of tips that will be coming in will make this into a very busy time here before the election. One last thing. I assume lots of times uh, suspects or criminals are loath to talk to police. They're trying to protect themselves. On the other hand, there may be a possibility that somebody that's trying to do this kind of crime wants the notoriety and may be willing, actually, to talk to police. What's, what's your sense of that? So the shooter had a GoPro, supposedly, there with them. So he wanted to, uh, to record this, uh, to be able to put out on uh, the Internet, maybe. Uh, maybe live stream it. We don't know. But uh, this is a person who wanted this event to be known. Uh, that being said, uh, police will have one opportunity to interview him. The uh, FBI will have one opportunity to interview him before he gets represented. Uh, once he's represented, his attorney is going to tell him not to talk to the police, not to talk to the FBI. And then uh, well, uh, that will be it as far as figuring it out, uh, unless he is willing to provide information on his own. All right. Well, it'll be interesting to find out if we learn any more over the next day or so. Retired FBI agent Kenneth Gray, thank you. Thank you. A Canadian legend is receiving country music's top honours. As Katie Lang enters the Canadian Country Music Hall of Fame, she tells me she's always been country. I really did grow up in the prairies. Electric vehicles are not rolling off the lot as fast as expected, and some point to their price. If I make a mistake buying an EV or it, it doesn't suit my, my lifestyle, I mean, that's a $65,000 problem. So is the future still electric? The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Canadian stars Eugene and Dan Levy made history at the Emmy Awards in Los Angeles tonight, becoming the first father-son duo to host the show. The Bear is off to a winning start, with Jeremy Allen White taking the best lead actor in a comedy series, while The Crown star Elizabeth Debicki won Best Supporting Actress in a Drama Series. A public hearing into the Titan submersible disaster begins tomorrow in the U.S., Five people were killed on a voyage to the Titanic wreckage site last year. But as Sam Sampson reports, not everyone is confident the hearing will provide answers. An American submersible sets off from a Canadian port and implodes in international waters, killing everyone on board. This is one of the most complex investigations that I've ever been involved with. The U.S. Coast Guard's two-week hearing begins Monday. The aim is to find out what led to the tragedy around Ocean Gate's Titan submersible last June. All passengers were killed, including the private company CEO, Stockton Rush. We are going all the way back for the entire operations of Ocean Gate. And we're looking at the entire safety framework that's in place to oversee these types of operations. While the U.S. Coast Guard conducts thousands of investigations each year, most are for floating vessels. It's unusual because it's a submersible, but also because it was in very deep water, uh, uh, almost a thousand miles uh, to sea from uh, New England. So it made recovery of the evidence very difficult, and that took longer. But some are not optimistic the hearings will lead to answers. David Concanon, a lawyer who was supposed to be on the vessel that day, declined an interview, but he told me in a text he thinks the hearings are pointless. And the testimony about the search and recovery efforts has no relevance to determining what caused the sub to implode. 
the Canadian Coast Guard watched a Canadian vessel tow the Titan through the St. John's Harbour for years. The submersible not safety certified to any international standard. Experts say the industry is self-regulated and growing. They hope these hearings can help change that. They're going to say, have we reached this tipping point now that there's so many of these going on that to protect the public, we need to do a very robust package and bring it to Congress. Monday's hearings will start with Ocean Gate's engineering director responsible for design and safety. Sam Sampson, CBC News, Edmonton. Now we go deeper into the stories shaping our world. How to boost the sputtering growth in electric vehicle sales. We do have to address some of those barriers to demand. But first. Katie Lang soaks up all the love as she's inducted into the Canadian Country Music Hall of Fame. The warm welcome, a long time coming. Certainly my sexuality was challenging, but it was also intriguing. From country tunes to soaring ballads, Katie Lang delivered emotion, power, and always originality. I sat down with her in Edmonton, her birthplace, just before her historic induction. Here we are in Edmonton. You're about to be inducted in the Canadian Country Music Hall of Fame. Yeah. Did you see that coming? Never. I never did, actually. I didn't even think about it. Um, but obviously, I'm thinking about it a lot in the last few weeks. And my hotel room overlooks the north, which I see the hospital I was born. Yeah. So Edmonton is such a part of who I am. It's in my blood. And just to be coming back here for this occasion is, is um, ooh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's very rich. Very, very rich. And the embrace, I would assume, this says about the country music industry, the community of you. Well, yeah, I didn't really experience that before, yeah. but now I'll take it. <laughs> no, I think I did. I certainly experienced it in Edmonton, but in country music in general, maybe not. But I knew what I was getting into. So we were born the same year. So as you launched your career kind of nationally and publicly, I was sitting there in front of my TV watching you. And, and I, I can think back to those days and how amazed I was, certainly of your talent, like your voice is so beautiful, but also your exuberance, how unique you were, your enthusiasm. <laughs> Like, where did all that come from? Hmm. Well, I've been thinking about this, too, in the last few days and weeks. Um, you know, I came from a classical background, but then, you know, in my, in my late teens, early 20s, I was actually a performance artist with a, with a group here in Edmonton. So we really incorporated, you know, conceptual art and... and yeah, found objects and you know we were just doing a lot of different things so when I shifted into country music I brought all that with me um, and I think that that's what made me different is that I never really saw saw the need to hone down into something that already existed I just I just kind of allowed myself to bring all the tools that I had as an artist into country music. Johnny! And I think what's fascinating about, about looking back at what I did is that I really brought all, all of the aspects of who I was into country music. Like I really did grow up in the prairies. I really did grow up helping my friend do the chores. I really did see chickens get their heads cut off. Mm -hmm. I really did drive around in trucks and drink Kahlua and milk and listen to country music, you know? That, that is my history. But that's not where it ends. I studied classical music. I, you know, um, I, I had a lot, of, a lot of variations as well. Like I said, I was a performance artist, so that, that's quite skewing quite to the left. So I just find it interesting, and I, I would love to promote using your own cultural history to make you who you are as an artist. I think it's essential. 
31 years ago, I think, 32 years ago, you, you came out publicly. Um, and then there was the Vanity Fair cover with Cindy Crawford back when magazines really mattered, right? And mm -hmm. that, was, that, was a, that was a really big moment for a lot of people. What was that time in your life like for you? Well, it was a very, very uh, profound period because the AIDS crisis was in full-on uh, raging mode and a lot of people were dying. So it was, it was real, it was threatening, and homophobia was very prevalent. Um, and my stardom was on the rise, but I felt a real sense of urgency to come out and take responsibility and to change the narrative of, of being outed on one hand or being, uh, being outed on either the, the far left or the far right, you know, mm -hmm. um, just like owning it and saying, yes, I'm gay and, um, you know, just starting a conversation and a, a realistic acknowledgement that it's that that the culture exists and it's normal and be, because homophobia was raging. And and just before that, you had taken a stand. Uh, you were part of the Meat Stinks campaign. Meat stinks, not just for the animals, but for human health and the environment. And I mean, I get the sense, I was looking back at some of the old coverage, that might have had a bigger <laughs> impact on your fan base and your hometown than, than coming out. It did, yeah, it did. We were proud of the young lady at, at one time, and she's killed that pride. She's like family, we loved her, we were so proud of her, we've got her name down below the hill, and now we're ashamed to have her name there. And you know, obviously I'm still a vegetarian, and um, I'm a Buddhist, uh, so, but I think my approach would have been a little different with Meat Stinks now. I think, you know, obviously, I like to raise the idea of consciousness and um, mindfulness in terms of what we consume and how we consume it. Um, but I, I wasn't a fan of the text that I was given to read on, on the onset of that ad. Um, but I'm, I still stand by the idea of having an honest conversation with yourself about what you consume. And again, like, like I said, here you are about to be a, a Hall of Famer by the, you know, and so the industry has, has kind of embraced you, <laughs> Yeah, right? well, Nixon got a stamp. I mean, <laughs> let's be honest. <laughs> Let's talk about music for a moment. And, and we're going to play for our audience a montage of, of some of your musical highlights. So imagine a world where we've just played uh, probably a little bit of crying. crying a constant craving. Maybe a little bit of your duet, a duet with uh, Tony Bennett. And we still can see There have been so many highlights in your career, like musical highlights, uh, Grammy wins, you know, from pop vocalist to country vocalist. It really shows your range. What would you put among the highlights of your career? You know, I, when I think about my career, I don't think about like a, like a very traditional trajectory. I think for me, it was all about performance. Like, yeah, Constant Craving was the only song that got played on the radio, really. Crying maybe a little bit, but no, Crying did quite well. But I wasn't a radio, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't a music star, really. I was a performance, I, I was a performer. Like, I did a lot of television, like a lot, a lot, a lot of TV. Mm -hmm. and, and then kind of became a personality, I think, more than anything. Um, with the coming out and the meat stinks and then the performances. It was, it's more like, I'm not an ordinary music star. Well, it goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major left, the baffle king composing, hallelujah. You know, 
know, it just occurred to me that, that there was a time when people thought of you as a throwback, you know, you, your connection, spiritual, musical connection to Patsy Cline or, you know, Loretta Lynn. Like, but now I kind of think you were maybe born at the wrong time. Like, given your... I agree. Yeah, with like your politics, if you want to call it that, but, but all your, your independence, um, your love of performance, like you were made for Instagram. Yeah, and the sapphic summer. I mean, where was I for the sapphic summer? I missed the whole damn thing. Um, yeah, I feel like I was, I feel like I'm actually in a couple different eras. Like I feel like as a singer, I'm in the 40s. I, I, should, I should have lived in the 40s. And, but culturally, yeah, I should be young now. But I, I, I kind of like being the elder and having, you know, I came out, what, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. and I did meet things, you know, talked about veganism 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of like, you know, kind of like sitting back and going, yeah, right on. Yeah. Things are evolving slowly. <laughs> It has been a delight to finally get a chance to sit down and talk to you as somebody who has watched you admiringly for like probably 30 years. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. It is I, right back at you. I feel the same way about you. Normally we post the interviews online the weekend that they appear on TV. Not this time because we spent about 25 minutes talking to KD, and there's so much good stuff. So Greg, the producer, is doing an extended cut, and uh, we'll post it probably uh, by Tuesday night. So I hope you wait for that. Next, the excitement to buy electric appears to be slowing. Where are we at in the transition to EVs? Yeah, I'd say we've, we've definitely passed the early adopter phase. We unpack what may be stopping the next wave of customers. Canada's electric vehicle industry primed for takeoff, so why aren't there more buyers? If I make a mistake buying an EV, I mean, that's a $65,000 problem. What the industry needs to meet all those lofty expectations. A lot of Canadians today just don't know what they don't know about EVs. We often hear the future for cars is green and gas-free. Nisha Patel shows us what's holding that back. The headlines about electric cars have been gloomy lately. The company is shifting its EV strategy. They say car makers are reversing course on building EVs. It could be a, a tough year for selling EVs. And customers are losing interest in buying them. But many experts insist the future is still electric. Here's why. Five years ago, barely anyone buying a new car in Canada chose an EV. Fast forward to today, and zero emission vehicles make up nearly 13% of the market, a record high. While it's not a straight line up, it's clear that sales are still growing, just not as quickly as expected. So where are we at in the transition to EVs? Yeah, I'd say we've, we've definitely passed the early adopter phase. JD Nye tracks the auto sector for market research company JD Power. He says most early adopters, who rush to buy new technologies, have bought into EVs. The next step, though, is to convince a, a much wider swath of Canadians that electrification is, is right for them. That mainstream buyer is less wealthy and more practical. In a JD Power survey, many Canadians said EVs are still too expensive. They also worry about how far they can travel and how difficult it will be to charge the battery. If I make a mistake buying an EV or it, it doesn't suit my, my lifestyle, I mean, that's a $65,000 problem. That could explain why sales of plug-in hybrids are revving up. These models run on both battery power and gasoline, a good compromise for customers concerned about range and charging and less risky than going all electric. It's a trend that has car makers shifting gears. Back in 2021, car makers were investing billions of dollars in EVs and pledging that they would stop building gas-powered cars. But customers aren't going fully electric as quickly as predicted. And with most manufacturers still losing money on EVs, it's no surprise that they're making some adjustments. This year, GM said it will build fewer EVs. Ford plans to invest more in hybrids. Volvo is delaying plans to go all electric by 2030. 
Despite all that, car makers insist they're still committed to the cause. We'll be ready to go fully electric this decade, but if the market, infrastructure and customer acceptance is not quite there, we can allow that to take a few more years. For those customers hoping overseas car makers like China's BYD would bring cheaper EV models to North America, that may take longer too. After the federal government slapped 100% tariffs on Chinese-made EVs to give a jolt to domestic manufacturers. We are building an EV industry here. We have all of the ingredients for Canada to succeed in this sector. I'm convinced we'll continue to see a growth in EV adoption, but we do have to address some of those barriers to demand. In Canada, our target is that 100% of all light duty cars and passenger truck sales be zero emission by 2035. The federal government is using mandates to speed up the transition, pushing car makers to build EVs so there's more supply. The policy says by 2026, 20% of all new cars sold should be zero emission. By 2030, that target jumps to 60% and 100% by 2035. Ottawa is also trying to sweeten the deal for buyers. All Canadians can get up to $5,000 back if they choose a zero emissions vehicle. And depending on where you live, you could get even more. Quebec is the most generous, offering an additional rebate of $7,000. So it's no surprise that EV adoption there is soaring. There are also incentives available in the Atlantic provinces, Manitoba, BC and the Yukon. You can drive much farther in an EV these days. Most have a range of 300 kilometers or more and new charging infrastructure is being built every day. The biggest barrier to adoption seems to be the upfront cost, which often gives mainstream buyers sticker shock. Take the example of a compact SUV. The Toyota RAV4, which runs on gas, costs about $36,000. Compare that to the electric Hyundai Ioniq 5, with a price tag of more than $57,000. A recent government report says to spark consumer demand and meet federal targets, overall costs of EVs must drop more than 30%. So apart from price, what do you think would make a big difference to persuading Canadians to switch to an EV? I think it's important to note that 50% of Canadians have never even sat in an EV. A lot of Canadians today just don't know what they don't know about EVs. Between manufacturers, policymakers, uh, lobby groups, that's going to be one of the big tasks in the next uh, couple of years. So while the road to electric vehicles has hit some speed bumps, car makers haven't abandoned them. And customers might just be waiting for them to get a little cheaper. For now, the future is still electric, though the journey will take a little longer. As Nisha Patel showed us, electric vehicle sales in Canada have risen sporadically. But in the first half of this year, demand grew at a faster rate than it did in the U.S. Industry analysts say those incentives are making the difference. Next, the grandfather and grandson who became surprise classmates. It came pretty apparent that he knew more people in that class than I did. But will they sit beside each other in class? That's in our moment. This is a first day of school photo. You don't see that often. A grandfather and grandson together in the same class, in this case at UBC's Okanagan campus. Neither one knew they were going to be in the same class. Now they're classmates with that special connection. And tonight, these surprise study buddies make our moment. I heard about the fact that you could go to UBC if you're a senior uh, and take uh, university courses, so I was really excited about it. Took a course, no idea that Sam was also in the same, going to be in the same course at the same time. We thought it was maybe opposite semesters, and then we found out it was the same semester, and then now we're, we're classmates. We walked into class together, sat down at the back, and uh, as people started coming, it came pretty apparent that he knew more people in that class than I did, which was a little weird given the age gap. Uh, I'm involved in rugby locally and coaching rugby, and. Uh, so many of the players that are in our coach uh, rugby program were happen to be in this class. So we had like talked about it because uh, I want to, you know, drive my grandpa because I got parking and he doesn't. So, <laughs> so we try and uh, carpool whenever we can. <laughs> Parking's expensive out there. 
It's definitely special. It's definitely something not many people get to do, obviously. Like, getting to take a class with your grandpa, that's quite a special thing to have. I really was lucky that we ended up together, and now he's got to sit with me for <laughs> four months. <laughs> it's a pleasure. <laughs> It's a big country, lots of universities, lots of classes, but, you know, it's quite possible this is the only time this has happened, a grandfather and grandson in the same class. Uh, the grandson's 18 years old, the grandfather is 71. May we all be as vital and quick and funny when we're 71 as he is, and hopefully they'll have a great school year. Thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Ian Hannah-Mansing in Vancouver. Good night.